Welcome to the gold medal celebration, award, reception, event tonight. And for those of you that are not very familiar with Tallahassee Scientific Society, this is a signature event of ours that has been going on for many years. And, um, and just so you know how all of this happens is that, well, let me see a show of hands of members, TSS members out there. Okay, so you received an invitation to nominate someone that you thought represented the uh, scientific credentials and outreach and education that we're looking for. And so then uh, we solicited uh, nominations and then the board reviews the nomination, the board of directors reviews the nominations and ranks them and selects a candidate. And then, um, and then the process for the reception and the event happens. So, it really comes down to members, and we really appreciate members that take the time to uh, nominate an individual. This year was pretty tough for the board. We had some really good candidates, and of course we uh, selected Dr. Ken Hansen, and, um, who was nominated by more than one person. And so it's been really fun looking at his chemistry and knowing about his outreach. Activities. I'm used to having the podium up here, actually. Um, let's see. Oh, and so the gold medal event is held in conjunction with the annual meeting of members. And so typically after this event, then we have a very short, less than five minute uh, member meeting and just um, we ask for approval of the slate of officers for the next year. I wanted to give a shout out to uh, Carol Zimmerman who has coordinated all the logistics for this evening and the reception. Um, a lot of details there and it's, it's very stressful for her. So if you see her, pat her on the back and say thank you. Um, and I wanted to allow Alan Hanstein to come up and say a little bit about the Challenger. He's the awesome executive. A, a, few, a few brief words. I think after TED Talks, we, we got rid of the podium. Like, we don't have this anymore. Uh, uh, my name is Alan Hanstein. I'm uh, lucky enough to be the executive director here at the Challenger Learning Center. Um, we are the K-12 STEM outreach program for the FAMU FSU College of Engineering, in case you didn't know that. And um, the relationship that we have with TSS, I, I think, is one of the most important ones we have. It's one that I thoroughly cherish. The events that we have here have been incredible, even long before I was the executive director. And anything that I can do now to help uh, that relationship flourish, I will always do so. You are all welcome here. I did want to take an opportunity to talk about a few new things and events that we have going on. I'll try and do them very quickly. Um, Deep Sky, our new IMAX film is now uh has opened last week if you haven't seen that yet that is a uh, uh, imax film about the james webb space telescope it is absolutely incredible and gorgeous highly encourage you to come in to see that with that we're also opening a show here in the planetarium uh, built by savannah up at the top say hi savannah hi our planetarium director uh called web unfolding the past that's a supplement to the imax film we also have on november 9th a very special event dark universe the uh, neil degrasse tyson narrated and written planetarium show will be opening here in the dome uh as part of a special event to raise money for his actual visit on january 24th you can buy those tickets online at challenger tlh.com the money raised will support student tickets for fsu and famu students to uh, come to his January talk for free. So we're super excited about that. And if that wasn't just all science, um, November 12th, we have Fiddler on the Roof sing-along. So if you uh, also enjoy the arts, come on and uh, buy a ticket. That's gonna be a lot of fun. And uh, with that, congratulations. And thank you all for coming, for supporting the Challenger Center and um, for promoting science in Tallahassee. And thanks to the Challenger for your support of TSS. It really means a lot. You make everything work here when we have events here, and we really, really appreciate it. Um, 
So I, all, I wanted to thank FSU Arts and Sciences for the great communication job they did. They really helped us out and got the word out. And actually, I heard a little plug on WFSU this afternoon. So um, that was out there, and that was a nice surprise. Um, so for those of you that aren't familiar with Ken's work, I really encourage you to go to his homepage, the Hanson Research page. Uh, his, you guys really keep that up well, and um, there's a lot of information about his science, about his outreach, about the background, about the members of his lab, so um, take some time and enjoy that. The only thing I wanted to uh, mention about him and, and his background is just, um, you know, you always need to do this. So he got his PhD at USC, and after he got his PhD at USC, he went and did a postdoc at, um, wait, I said you. USC, and then UNC for uh, a postdoc fellowship at Chapel Hill, and then he came to FSU. And so FSU <laughs> was really lucky enough to get you, and now we're lucky enough to have you in the Tallahassee area and uh, be able to receive this award. And uh, we actually do have a gold medal <laughs> that we will give you, and Carol, I'm gonna go find Carol and tell her. Oh, there you are, Carol. Oh, <laughs> I love that. Thank you, Carol, because that's the sort of thing I do all the time. So we're going to get that gold medal to you, Ken. Don't you worry. Um, so with that, let me invite um, Ken up to tell us about his research and uh, the out outreach he's done. Um, so I've known of uh, Ken, Ken's work, um, his booth at uh, Railroad Square on First Fridays for a while, and TSS was trying to piggyback with them. Um, and this was during COVID. And so they had lots of extra space. And unfortunately, because there was lots of extra space because of COVID, we didn't sign up. And so post COVID, we haven't been able to get a table there, but we're still trying. And it'd be really nice to interact with Dave Collins, is it, I think, that does that. So thank you and congratulations. Oh, you're all yeah, thank you very much for the introduction and, and thank TSS for what you guys do as well as the award. It, it, it really is an honor and a privilege. I mean, looking at the people even in my department that have received this award in the past, you have people like Alan Marshall and Michael Kasha and, and uh, Harry Croto. I mean, these are Nobel Prize winners, National Academy members, uh, Lawton professors, and now me. So uh, I'm going to consider this slightly aspirational in terms of I have, you know, a lot of big shoes to, uh, to fill in terms of this role. But uh, thank you very much for this opportunity. It really is is an honor to receive this award. Um, there's a lot of awards out there that celebrate science and contributions to science, but very few that focus on you know science plus education plus outreach, and it's really underappreciated. Those should be the three prongs that we're all doing as science because we need to you know help educate the public as well as advocate for science on every level possible. And so it really is an honor and a privilege to be here. And so yeah, I, I have a, a quick presentation. By quick, I was told I have 30 minutes. I, I will do my best to keep this in that 30 minute window. Note I've never given this time talk before, but I talk fast, so it should work out. Uh, but anyway, yeah, photochemical research in the a in, and science outreach in the age of social media. Uh, this screen is overwhelming. It's a tragic underutilization to use a PowerPoint on just that portion, but we're going to do our best. Uh, but yeah, there's the outline. I'll first talk a little bit about my research, then some education stuff, and then the outreach component. And so when talking about my research, I'm a molecular photochemist slash photophysicist, which is a very fancy way of saying I shine light on molecules and then stuff happens, right? And a lot of different stuff can happen. You can move electrons, you can move protons, you can make and break bonds, you can give off light, you can give off heat, uh, you can make new products. And so it's, it's, it, my big goal is understanding what happens when light hits molecules and if we can do something useful with that. And so when you look historically at literature and research and things like that, most of the research on molecular photophysics, you put a molecule in solution and you study its properties in solution. And there's really no reasons to do that, right? You, you can control concentrations, control ratios, molecules collide. But there's a lot of reasons why you don't just want molecules free floating around. And so nature actually shows this already. And so if we look at any photosynthetic system, and we'll just do a tree, for example, we zoom in on a leaf, we zoom in a little bit further. If you're a, a biologist, you typically draw pictures that look like this that have shapes and they have light, light harvesting centers and then a reaction core here that does you know all the chemistry. Um, but I'm a chemist so I want to look at this on a molecular level. 
And so if you zoom in on a photosynthetic system close enough, you'll see structures that look something like this. And so every one of these molecules is a chlorophore molecule. That's basically what gives plants its green color. And so that's why plants absorb light is because of these molecules right here. But it's not enough to absorb light. You gotta focus that light somewhere and do something useful with that light energy. And so you absorb a photon, you transfer that energy through these cascading processes, transfer it again, you move that energy around the circle, you move it to this final ring here, move it around a little bit more, and eventually you dump that energy on something called the P870 core. At this P870 core, you essentially take molecules in their excited state, make an electron go one way and a hole go the other way. And what you can do with that is start to do redox chemistry, which is basically the foundation of photosynthesis. You're making complex molecules from the energy of the sun. And the key to this working is that these molecules are organized in a, a very particular way, where any of these molecules can absorb that light and very rapidly transfer that energy to this P870 core. So you can think about it as an antenna focusing energy down to a particular reaction center. And that's great. Like nature is really good at doing this and it had, you know, billions of years to evolve this structure. As humans, we don't get that luxury or control, at least not yet. And so that's one of the things we're trying to do is, can you control structures? And so my research group does a particular assembly motif called metal ion linked multilayers. And so the idea is we take some kind of inorganic metal oxide surface. And so this is typically zirconia oxide or titanium dioxide. And what we do is soak it in molecules and molecules that are functionalized with very particular groups that like to interact with surfaces. And so what we can do is essentially organize these molecules on the surface, but we take it beyond that. One molecule is great, but we want to have assemblies that can cascade energy. And so we want to put multiple molecules together. And so what we do is soak this in a metal ion. And so you can see this metal ion coordinates the outside, and then we can add another molecule on the outside. And so all of a sudden you can start to see we're making these assemblies from a surface up to the, the uh, towards the solution. And so we've used these metal ion linked multilayers for a number of different applications. Uh, example of energy and electron cascade, very similar idea to what they do in natural photosynthesis where you absorb light and direct it towards the surface and then get electrons away from it. That's effectively a solar cell. Uh, other things like controlling how fast electrons move between a surface and a molecule, uh, things like singlet fission, this idea of taking a one photon, which is a packet of solar energy, and converting that to two electrons. So you can imagine making more photocurrent in a solar cell. And then the one I'm going to tell you about briefly is this idea of photon up conversion. And so uh, whether you know it or not, most of you are familiar with photon down conversion. In fact, this is what happens when you shine light on something and it gives you light back. You get something like this, where you essentially have blue light going in and then it excites something inside of here and then it gives off green light. And so this is the reason you use black lights in the bowling alleys at night, right? It's high energy UV photons and it can give you red, green, blue, all sorts of different colors. In fact, this solution right here, this, this uh, diphenyl anthracene, uh, diphenyl acetylene anthracene molecule, this is actually the molecule that's in green glow sticks. And so you essentially, you can excite this with light or energy and it's gonna give off green photons and that makes perfect sense, right? High energy blue giving you low energy green. What about something like that that's doing the exact opposite? And so the physicists in the room are upset right now because that violates the second law of thermodynamics, right? We're taking green light and we're converting to blue light. That doesn't make sense. Uh, the thing is, we're not violating anything. We just cheat. And the way we cheat is we put more than one molecule together. And so we take something called a sensitizer and an annihilator, and we effectively excite this guy uh, sequentially, not at the same time. And it's going to dump energy into several of these anthracene molecules. And two of these anthracene molecules are going to collide, and they're going to do something called triplet-triplet annihilation, where they basically combine those two photons together together to generate a higher energy excited state, and then you can get a blue photon out of it. And so that's why it's not violating thermodynamics. We're just cheating. We're taking two green photons and generating one blue photon. And so that's cool. It's a fun demonstration. You can literally do it with a laser pointer and a solution that you bubble to gas. But the question is, why do you do it? Right? And so there's a bunch of different applications. There's like photodynamic therapy and holograms and 3D imaging and, and night vision goggles and things like that. But the one I'm really interested in is solar energy conversion. And so we don't have to go into the details of the graph, but this is uh, basically a graphical depiction of something called the Shockley-Quesser limit, which is basically the thermodynamic limits of what a solar cell can do. And so you might have heard of the Carnot cycle or, or Carnot limitations of a heat engine. There's a similar mathematical analysis you do on solar cells that basically says you have a relationship between the band gap of the material and the energy conversion efficiency. And this number right here is what you hear all the time when you talk about solar cells. It's like the solar cell is 20% efficient. You're talking about this axis here. And so what Shockley and Quester did is they did a cost benefit analysis that said, you know, here's the maximum efficiency curve and it's limited by transmission losses, light going through the cell and thermalization losses basically relaxing from a higher energy state. 
And so if you do all that cost benefit analysis, it basically tells you for a standard solar cell, the theoretical maximum is going to be 33%. And so if you buy a commercial silicon solar cell, the number is somewhere about 20%, which is a realistic number. But yeah, that's what the universe limits to you, you too. And one of the issues is this transmission losses, right? This, this big red chunk of the efficiency that drops at well below 100%. And so if we look at the solar spectrum, this is basically wavelength on this axis versus intensity that's coming off the sun. The visible portion is basically from here to here, and then here's a whole bunch of near IR photons. And so most solar cells don't absorb this portion of the spectrum because of that band gap cutoff. And so Ekans, Dox, and Schmidt in 2008 basically said, what if we could use photon up conversion? Let's take those low energy photons, combine them together, make them a higher energy photon, and then all of a sudden we can start harnessing that. And if we can do that, we have this new curve here where it basically cuts out some of those transmission losses, and we can bump that number to 45%. And so yeah, on paper, this is awesome. You should be able to make solar cells better by doing photon up conversion. So how do we do it? So going back to these two molecules here that we have in solution, it's really hard to take solutions and generate electricity, right? They don't like to do that. They don't like to make photo current and things like that. Uh, so instead, what we do is we attach them onto a surface. And we do this for a few different reasons. We do it because we can assemble them in proximity, but we also have them on a surface that can extract electrons and generate current out of the system. And so that's what we do. We effectively incorporate this upconversion idea into a solar cell. We have a photoanode, we have a cathode, a redox mediator in between. You hook up some wires, you have a voltmeter, and you all of a sudden have a, effectively have a solar cell. And so I won't get into the details of this, but basically you can take either of these components individually and you'll get a little bit of photocurrent on them. But if you put these guys together, all of a sudden you get four times the sum of the parts. So despite absorbing the same amount of light, we get more current out of the system. And then here's a graph here. I won't get into the details, but basically a normal solar cell that takes one photon and generates one electron gives you a straight line. If it's doing that triplet triplet annihilation process where two molecules are involved, it gives you this quadratic to linear behavior. And so it says the photocurrent that's generated out of this device is doing it due to triplet triplet annihilation. And so essentially this was the first demonstration that you could integrate triplet triplet annihilation into a functioning solar cell. And so that's exciting, but uh, here's the number 0.009 milliamps per centimeter squared. And I'll add some context to that in a little bit. Um, and so what we've done in the field is we've effectively started tracking progress, saying how good are we at harnessing up conversion? And so on the x-axis is time, on the y-axis is how much current are we getting out of up conversion? And this uh, nine microamps per centimeter squared at the time was a world record. So in 2016, that was the best anyone had ever done harnessing up conversion in a solar cell. Um, we've, we've expanded quite a bit. We played around with the molecules and the materials and the things. We mixed match components, and we got up to 315 microamps per centimeter squared, which is great. We get in this device relevance region, which is basically a line in the sand that we drew that said, if you want to be above the noise floor of a solar cell, you got to be up in this photocurrent type range. And so that's great. If we get above one milliamp, all of a sudden we start making a device uh, efficiency difference. And so, yeah, world record, that's pretty spectacular. It still remains the world record. We've actually gone down with certain modifications. But the thing I want to bring your attention to is if I talk realistically about this method, that's where a commercial solar cell is, which is greater than 20 milliamps per centimeter squared. And so not only is this number small, but like this is a logarithmic scale. So if we're going to be realistic, that's what the graph looks like. And so let's be honest with ourselves, right? There's no, no funding officers in the audience. I'm going to just lay it out there for you guys. This is not going to solve the energy crisis, right? It's just not. And we could get this up to one milliamp per centimeter squared, and maybe it would make a difference. But if we're being honest, like, it's not just efficiency we're chasing. It's efficiency per cost, right? And so if I had to add a, extra bells and whistles to a solar cell and it becomes more expensive, is that extra increase worth it? Maybe not. And so uh, we spent a decade chasing this problem. When we wrote this perspective article here, Harnessing Sunlight via Molecular Photon Up Conversion, it's actually co-authored with Tim Schmidt, the one that wrote the original paper propose, proposing this. And we basically said, let's be honest with ourselves. What efficiency gains do we need for this to be realistic? And the honest answer is it might not be physically possible. And so after 10 years of chasing these numbers, it's probably not going to be the answer to the solar energy issue, right? The, the issue of what's going to be the answer is probably some solar cell you can paint on a wall. Nothing elegant like photon up conversion, just brute force photocurrent generation that's really, really cheap. And so, yeah. It was fun. We had fun chasing this. We learned a lot, especially about this multi-layer assembly strategy. But ultimately, we've kind of turned our attention away from this because realistically, we don't think this is going to solve major problems. 
But thankfully, this multi-layer assembly, this idea of putting molecules together and constructing these, these, these multi-layer structured, uh, it, it's been picked up by a bunch of other people. And so here's just some examples generating like uh, reducing CO2 to make things like methanol or generating hydrogen fuel from sunlight, uh, molecular rectifiers where you can charge separate things and, and have really long lived species and have like molecular electronics. And then we showed this earlier about brown bad solar cells where you can absorb a lot of light. And so, yeah, the, the things we learned aren't necessarily just applicable to photon up conversion. Instead, we can take this knowledge and we can apply it to all sorts of different domains. We're even now uh, starting to think about this in terms of quantum computing and quantum information sciences. What can you do with these assemblies? And so the next step in our research is basically starting to figure out what the structure is. Like we know we put these assemblies together, we know energy and electron transfer is happening, uh, but we're using things like anisotropy, attenuated total reflectance, and molecular dynamics to start really getting a picture of what's happening in the system. And so we really wanna understand what the structure is. And so going back full circle to our original image, I mean, step one is understanding the structure, step two is controlling it. Right? And so right where we are right now is understanding it. And now we get pictures that look something like this. And so obviously not as elegant as photosynthetic system. You give me another couple billion years, I'll be on top of it. But uh, we're doing our best with what we have with the system and knowledge we have. So really exciting. We've learned a lot about these metal ion linked multilayers. Uh, just a few notes about a few other projects. So I'm a photochemist, which means photons are my hammer and every single problem is a nail, right? I'm gonna solve everything with light. And so one example of this is photomechanics, this idea of using light to generate mechanical force. And so we have polymers when you shine light on them. If you shine vertical polarized light, it'll bend the polymer towards you. If you do horizontal, it bends the polymer away. And so you can actually control mechanical processes with photon energy. Other things like uh, uh, excited state proton transfer catalysis, there's molecules when you shine light on them, they, they turn like 10 orders of magnitude more acidic. So you can take something that's effectively a base, shine light on it and turn it into an acid and use those protons to drive chemical processes like uh, protonation events and all sorts of different things. We've also used those molecules to do things like hydrogen generation, where you can have two independent light absorption events and actually generate hydrogen fuel out of the system. And so it's worked out pretty well on that front. Other things like metal ion sensing, where you can take these proton transfer dyes and effectively, in the absence of a metal, it looks a certain way. You add a metal to it, you can see emission and the absorption color changes. So you can actually see the color change really vibrantly. Uh, one other thing we've done, this one's kind of fun, is photochemical separations. Uh, like there's mixtures of metals pretty much everywhere and you want to try to separate them. One way you can do it is with light. And so we effectively take uh, iron and ruthenium mixed together. If we shine one wavelength, we can separate ruthenium. If we shine another wavelength, we can separate iron. And so nobody really cares that we can separate ruthenium and iron, but if you can apply this to things like curium and am americium, all of a sudden you can separate nuclear waste and have much more productive uh, processing and uh, recycling of that material. So yeah, kind of fun photochemistry. Photons are my light, light drives everything. And so yeah, it's been really exciting. All right, on to phase two. And so I've been hired at an R1 institution, which is FSU, right? And the thing about being hired at that, I was hired to do research, but my contract says I'm 25%, 30% a teacher, right? But I have no formal education in teaching of any kind. And so we just kind of do our best and we just make it up as we go. And so I end up teaching about one class a semester. And so I switch between a graduate class in group theory and in organic spectroscopy and an undergraduate course in general chemistry too. And so one of the things I reflect on is like, am I doing any good? Am I a good teacher? And so one way to assess that is we could go to rate my professor. Right? And so we could look at our numbers. 4.5 in difficulty, 77% would take me again. That's not bad. I'm doing okay on that front. You can see the distribution. But if we're being honest, these are kind of arbitrary assignments, right? They're perception and they're not actual learning gains. One thing that tells you that is these are my favorite. Um, these are on the exact same day. So I'm both awesome and awful simultaneously. So Schrodinger's teacher. And so you knew something similar with the end of semester evaluations at FSU. And I do pretty good on these, especially the smaller classes, honors classes versus the big class. And this is what they use to effectively decide teaching awards at FSU. And so through these evaluations, I got like three nominations and ultimately won a teaching award at FSU. And that's awesome, right? Like that's an honor, that's a privilege. Students like me, that's great. But it doesn't really answer my original question. Just because students like me doesn't mean they're learning anything. And so the two pending questions I always had, are students learning anything and how would I know, right? Because that's ultimately what we want to do. That's what a good teacher is. It's not if you like me, it's whether you gain actual knowledge. 
And so what ended up happening is I became obsessed with testing theory. And so we're using things like uh, classical testing theory and modern testing theory to analyze exams, figure out questions are good, figure out if the exam is good. Is it actually assessing what I think it's assessing? And so it's been really satisfying. I dove into this world of statistics. We published a few papers in Journal of Chemical Education. In this case, using classical and modern testing theory to improve exams, analyze outcomes, say which questions are good, which questions are bad, can I make them better? And then we had a surprise case study where as soon as COVID came in, we had to go from in-person to online testing. And one of the fundamental questions is, is there a difference between in-person in and online assessment? And we had the basis to actually test that because we had three years worth of in-person data. We compared it to online. And what's interesting is there was no outcomes difference, at least in the type of test I get. And so no change in the ter uh, student performance, no change in the prevalence of cheating among students, which is a shocker, but kind of cool that that exists. And so now I've exclusively gone to online testing because it's easier for everyone. It saves TAs time and things like that. So yeah, pretty exciting that that one actually happened. So moving forward, um, something we're doing right now is um, doing a transition from traditional lecture to active learning. And so traditional lecture is basically what I'm doing right now. You stand in front of a room and you lecture to students, and students leave this room with this artificial sense that they understand things, right? Because I'm good at presenting this and I present it very clearly, and they think they have that same knowledge set, and the reality is they don't. And so this idea of active learning is, is going from me doing the work to the students doing the work. And so we do a lot of clicker questions where I put a clicker question up on the screen, and they answer the question, we talk through how you think about the answer. Because it's much more important the process rather than just the outcome. Because the answer, real science doesn't have exact answers. The process is far more important than the outcome. And so that's pretty exciting. The other one we're working on is detecting cheating via generative AI chat. And so there's a lot of concern with things like chat GPT and then people using that to cheat. Uh, turns out chat GPT doesn't answer test questions the way a student would. Even on a multiple choice exam, it gets certain things right that it should get wrong and it gets certain things wrong that it should get right. And we can actually use the statistics to see it. It's basically a five sigma outlier in terms of the behavioral pattern compared to a student. And so kind of exciting. Uh, we'll keep you posted on both of those. Those should be hopefully coming out in the next couple of years. All right, final branch of this is science outreach. And this is this has been an interesting journey for me because it's entirely accidental. Like I'm, I'm a mildly autistic introvert. Like I don't like interacting with people. I would rather present in front of a room for, full of people than talk one-on-one -on -one with someone. And so it's been an interesting journey. And my journey actually started back in 2006. And so it was on Reddit. So if you're not familiar with Reddit, it's basically this uh, information aggregating website where anyone can submit a news story or a comment or a question and people can reply and communicate. And so back in 2006, this had maybe 100,000 people and now it's something over 50 million people a day. And so it expanded dramatically. But uh, for me, this was where I started communicating science. And so there's subcategories and one of the subcategories was a chemistry subreddit. And so I became a moderator of the chemistry subreddit. I did a bunch of commenting. Uh, and then at, ultimately when I landed at FSU, I started my Hanson FSU account. Uh, this got me mo in trouble more than once with upper administration for things I might have been conflicted with FSU about, but that's a whole different story. <laughs> but anyway, one of the things that got me attention is my comments early on Reddit. And so one of the moderators of the Reddit was like, do you want to be a moderator? And then Mitch, his name is Mitch Andre Garcia, and he runs Chem Feeds, Chemical Forums, and chem ChemistryBlog.com. And he said, oh, Ken, you write comments. Are you interested in writing for Chemistry Blog? That was back in the day when blogs were still a thing. Not so much anymore. But back then, it was, it was pretty interesting because it gave me a venue to share information. And so one of my blog first blog posts was this, want to get out of jury duty, become a chemist. <laughs> And so this was me recounting my story at University of Southern California. I went there for jury, jury duty and one of the first questions they asked, does anyone know how a breathalyzer works? I know how a breathalyzer works. And then they followed up with, are you willing to abandon your expertise and defer to the expert that's testifying in court? I'm like, I could probably do that. They're like, can you stop yourself from thinking about your expertise? I'm like, nope. All right, we'll see you later. You're no longer on jury duty. And so that story actually got picked up by Nature Chemistry and they wrote a uh, short blip about it, so which is kind of fun. I mean, it's an interesting story uh, to say the least. But what's interesting is my most popular blog is this one. It's called Get a Job, Ken. And so uh, when I first got the job at FSU, I, I recognized something that was a problem, at least for me, is that if you don't come from the MITs, the Caltechs, the Berkeleys of the world, you're not surrounded by people doing the academic job search. And so for me, I, you know, 
USC and UNC, maybe I knew a couple people that were going to academia, but I didn't have the secrets, the tips, the tricks, the knowledge, the process. I didn't have that information. And so what I did is I wrote a blog post that said, here's my eight part series giving you every piece of information I have. And what's crazy about this is last time I checked the views, it's had over 500,000 views over 10 years, which is insane. In fact, if I go to a conference outside of photochemistry, I'm more well known for this blog post than anything. Arguably my biggest contribution to the scientific community was this, instructions how to get an academic job, which I don't regret at all, because it's like, let's help, let's even the playing field, let's give this knowledge to everyone if we can. So yeah, pretty fun on that front. Uh, the other thing that happened with this is I got invites to do guest blogs. And so here's one example, the Science Coalition. It's basically a lobbyist group that goes to Washington, D.C. and tries to advocate for science, you know, much like TSS tries to do. And so they, they invited me to write a blog and they asked, where will science take us in 20 years? New blog provides predictions for the year 2034. And so I wrote a story about this. I basically said, we need an army of solar powered cars that have parking garages. And so the thing about that is, I mean, that's that in itself is kind of a superficial thing, but the thing that caught their attention is like, how much space do we waste to cars parked outside of the building? Like when you guys walk out of this building, how much surface area is dedicated cars just sitting there during the day? If we could remove that, all of a sudden cities become walkable, we have much more trees, we have much more greenery. And that was the idea behind the article that I wrote, saying, you know, if we can uh, couple solar power to self-driving cars, all of a sudden we don't need personal cars anymore. We still have personal transportation, but we have a means of doing that. And so yeah, they ended up liking this blog post, which was Kind of fun, got some really good feedback, and also got invited to Washington, D.C. to do a congressional briefing. And so I ended up meeting with the uh, senators and, and the House representatives and basically saying, here's what I, my vision of the future could be. And the idea was these people are holding the purse strings behind, you know, finances of scientific research. And so uh, we, we have this historical trend of, oh, the Internet was funded by government dollars, but they decided, well, let's sell a vision going forward. So it was interesting. I mean, did it make a difference? Probably not, but we do our best, right? It's a war of attrition, just one battle at a time, and you try to sell your science to people. The other thing I did as soon as I arrived at FSU is I, I became best friends with the PR office, right? Because it's not enough to just do good science. You have to communicate your science with the world. And so this is basically a month after I arrived. Uh, new research groups, these bright future in solar cells. Uh, Kathleen Hogney has been great in terms of, you know, advocating for science and things like that. And so, yeah, we do regular news stories. And so here's another example, photochemical separations with light. Why are there two light sources? Why is there smoke? Why are they staring at it? because it looks cool. Nobody actually does that in the lab, but publicity matters, visuals matter, you gotta sell a vision, you gotta sell an image, and that's exactly what we try to do. And so we've worked with them a lot over the years. In fact, um, uh, more than once we've ended up in FSU's halftime commercial. So if you end up needing something that glows and looks pretty, call up Ken and he'll give you something like that, or you know, shots of spectroscopy, which is kind of cool. So my students get their, you know, what, two seconds of fame on a halftime commercial, which is kind of fun. <laughs> the other thing that happens is the, they also get contacted regularly needing experts in certain areas. And so if the Florida Channel needs a solar cell guy, I end up being that solar cell guy. My favorite example of this, I don't know if favorite's the right word, but there's a show on Discovery Channel called Strange Evidence. And what they do is they take like YouTube videos that are mysterious and they basically have a series of speakers that are like, it's a conspiracy, it's aliens, it's chupacabra. And then you have an expert that debunks all that. I got to be the expert, which is kind of fun. And so I got to do those interviews. You can see how you know backlit and mysterious that is, ambiance, because it's mysterious. Um, there are at least a few instances where they actually took my audio and edited it to make me look like the lunatic, which I'm not too happy about. But yeah, ask me about that afterwards. But nonetheless, I now have an IMDB page. So <laughs> internet presence expanded. So that's kind of fun. All right, the other thing we did was we started a Twitter and Instagram account. Um, one of the things we do as photochemists and we really love is we do beautiful chemistry, like light absorption, light emission, glowing things, uh, beautiful things that, that, that we can share with the world. And so we started that account and we started doing one photo a week. And so for basically the last 10 years, we have shared one photo a week of our science. And you get imagery that looks something like this. Um, yeah, which is pretty cool. Uh, in 2014, we submitted this to Chemical and Engineering News. That actually won the 2014 photo of the year for Chemical and Engineering news, which is awesome because we got a free camera as part of the award, so now we take even better pictures. And so, yeah, propagating that forward. Yeah, if you guys are interested in pretty science pictures, there we are at Hanson FSU on Twitter and Instagram. Uh, but that's probably not my favorite part about this. My favorite part about it is this. 
So this is actually a wall in our house. And so my wife gets to keep track of all the photos that come out of the group. She follows us on Twitter and she ultimately says, these look great, let's print them off. These are all metal prints that get hang hung on the wall in my house. And so we have this documentation of the science and progression of science throughout the years. And that's, that's really fun. But my favorite part is every student in my group effectively gets to sign their research. And so this is Jamie Wong, my first PhD student. It's actually this image right here, which was our first TOC. She got to sign it, so I have a record of my students and science as it progresses. And so, yeah, kind of a landmark for students as they progress through the group. Other things we've done, we have a YouTube channel. And so, not particularly pop popular. We have 475 subscribers, not, not breaking any records or quitting my day job with that. But it's been a lot of fun. We share, you know, uh, lectures that I might have or cool looking science or uh, the other thing we do is video abstracts where every time a student publishes a paper, they do a five to 10 minute video basically sharing that science. And so it's just a quick presentation. If any of you guys are interested, uh, fun note about YouTube and so this is, by far my most polished presentation. And so it's an introduction to transient absorption spectroscopy, which is basically shine light and then see what the color change is and you can monitor all sorts of events. This is by far my most polished presentation. It's like cradle to grave, here's from the ground up introduction to transient absorption spectroscopy. 12,000 views, pretty popular. The companies that sell these instruments actually share this video. I've gotten emails from all over the world saying thank you for it and thank you for the PowerPoint, blah, blah, blah. But the internet is a fickle place. 38,000 views for a 53 second video about three balloons popping. <laughs> so, yeah, that's really polished, but is it a balloon popping? <laughs> anyway, I'll sell it, save you guys as a search. It's a green laser, it pops the black balloon, it doesn't pop the green one, it doesn't pop the white one because the black balloon absorbs green, generates heat, and it pops that balloon, and that's worth 38,000 views. So. Thank you, internet. <laughs> All right, so like I said, I'm a mildly autistic introvert that doesn't necessarily like interacting with people, but sometimes I, I do, right? And sometimes I do it because I really like advocating for science. And so um, one of the things we did, or well, when I first arrived at FSU, my uh, next door neighbor, at least uh, my office neighbor, Greg Dudley, he basically said, hey, you guys should check out First Friday. And so most of you in the room are probably familiar with First Friday. The first Friday of every month at Railroad Square Park, they have you know music and art and, and ga games and food trucks and all sorts of stuff and you can hang out. And the thing I recognized when we went there, it was like, it seems like anyone can put up a tent. And um, we actually called, and by we, I mean my wife called and asked, can anyone put up a tent? And they said yes. And so that's exactly what we did. So, so we put up a tent, made a sign that said, ask a scientist, put up two whiteboards, one that lists scientists, one that lists a bunch of questions. And then I got a bunch of colleagues to essentially join me by this tent. And so uh, Greg Dudley, organic chemist, there's me, there's uh, Billy Oates, a mechanical engineer, Greg Erickson, biology, um, he does paleontology and things like that. And so I pay them in beer and they just hang out by a tent and answer questions. And so ultimately, Ultimately, it ended up looking something like this. You just set up the tent and people are like, what is going on? And then start talking to us. And it's really fun. It's a very diverse experience. It's some scientific curiosity, stump the scientist, existential and political questions. Does God exist? How do you feel about politics in Florida? Things like that. Absurd questions, confrontational questions. Uh, one of my favorite interactions ever at this, it was, it was a, a trucker that was traveling through town and saw this gathering and came up and he saw our tent and he's like, What's with all this global warming bullshit? I'm like, all right, that's a start. And so, but I, but I like those interactions because it, it really where you have to go is a common ground, right? And so ultimately after the exchange, I, I got him to say, you know, agree with me when I said, you know, do you really think 200 years of us pumping crap into the air has done nothing? And he's like, no, it's probably done something. Okay, that's a starting point. Then we can start talking about, you know, how much has it done? How do we know? How do we change it? Does it matter? And then we can start conversing on an equal level rather than confrontation. And so, yeah, a lot of fun. I really enjoy this exercise. And so over the six year interval that we ran it between 2014 and 2022, that's about 50 first Fridays and greater than 60 scientists across all sorts of different disciplines. Really a lot of fun. Um, but yeah, that fun unfortunately had to end. Uh, as you guys can see from the date, COVID-19 took over. And so March of 2020 was our last uh, in-person in, in Ask a Scientist, which was sad, but it, completely understandable. They shut down first Friday. We don't want this to be a super spreader event, especially as scientists. So 
So it goes. But don't worry, Ask a Scientist is back in person. And so if you guys are interested, tomorrow night between about 6 and 10 p.m., uh, if you go to Railroad Square Park, you can find out this House of Plywood Breezeway. And so if you go inside of there, you'll see us at a booth, either at a table or one of these booths, and you can actually interact with scientists in person. And so the person that runs it now is David Collins. And don't let the suit fool you. David is actually a really friendly, likable guy. He's really fun to interact with. You can tell because he labels this figure one with suit. <laughs> That's on his faculty profile, by the way. <laughs> and so David Collins, he invited um, uh, ecologist Joseph Travis, atmospheric scientist Allison Wing, mechanical engineer Billy Oates, who was at the first first Friday that we did, uh, and Brett uh, Stout Willett, who's an educational data scientist. You guys can check it out tomorrow night at first Friday at the House of Plywood. And if you're interested in actually participating, email David Collins. He's looking for volunteers. Anyone that wants to sit there, drink beer, and talk science with the general public, he would love to have you on as a guest. So feel free to join. Um, but like I said, this is something that I, I stepped away from David took over. Uh, one of the reasons I stepped away from it is I changed my attention to something else. And so uh, I'm going to talk about Twitch. And so many of you in this room might not be familiar with Twitch, but I've been an avid video gamer for over 30 years. And so video games had this interesting progression where it was people playing alone and then people playing via network cable together in a house and then people sharing video gaming over the internet. And ultimately it ended up with people streaming. And so one of the things Twitch is really well known for for the past 10 years is basically anyone with a camera and a video game can share that with the world. So they call it streaming to the internet. And you might be asking yourself, who would do that? And it turns out a lot of people. And so at any given moment, there's about 100,000 people live streaming their video gameplay, about 30 million viewers per day, which is a non-trivial audience just watching video games. And the thing I recognized about this was that it's not the best video gamers that get the audience, it's the most interesting people. So you can think of this much more like a podcast that's interactive where you can chat with the person and video games are just the background. And so with that in mind, I said, okay, that's what a millennial's midlife crisis looks like. You take this and set it up in your house. There's four lights, there's two microphones, there's my green screen, there's a whole lot of electronics that goes behind this. And I set up a Twitch stream. I basically said, okay, ask a scientist gaming, combining mediocre gameplay with professional science, our stream brings you experts in various scientific disciplines, playing games, drinking, and answering questions from chat. And that's what we do. And so every other Wednesday night, I have a guest, uh, typically someone from the Tallahassee area, a PhD scientist that basically picks their favorite video game and plays it while chat asks questions. And so I feed questions to the professor. And in this case, this is uh, Eugene DePrince. He's a, a quantum chemist at FSU. He's playing a little bit of Mario while answering questions about quantum chemistry. And so really a lot of fun. I've really enjoyed this journey over the years. Um, we've had 70 streams so far. Again, it's every other two weeks. It's almost three years worth of guests. Uh, 57 guests across all sorts of disciplines. Uh, what's fun is we've actually expanded to history, music theory, economics, and law. And so we've expanded uh, beyond the boundaries of the hard sciences. And I honestly, I, I almost like these guests more because I learn a lot more from them because I'm not even close to their domain. Everything they say to me is interesting and profound. And it's, it's been a lot of fun. And so yeah, if you guys are uh, worried about missing it, don't worry, it's on our YouTube channel. And so you can find every single one of those streams if you check out Ask a Scientist Gaming on YouTube. Uh, all of them are up there. All 70 of them are up there, plus a couple more. Um, if you're interested in being a guest, send me an email. I would love to have somebody that's willing to come on, play video games, talk science. It's a lot of fun. Every single guest that does it loves it and wants to come back, as far as I know. All right, so that's the journey, right? We talked about science, we talked about education, we talked about outreach, but none of this is possible without acknowledging uh, the people that made it possible. And so uh, it's an undeniable truth, especially over the last 70 years, most scientific progress has been built on the backs of graduate students working long hours for low pay. Um, I am no different. There's, there's my army of students throughout the years. They're the ones that made the research possible. They're the ones doing the experiments. They're the ones actually generating data and results. I'm just there to facilitate that process. And so, yeah, it's, it's, it's been an amazing experience over the last decade. Uh, that's our most recent photo as of two days ago. So almost everyone except for Sarah Lindbaum. I'm sorry, Sarah, she wasn't available for the photo. Um, but yeah, I really appreciate what they do. Uh, the system is broken. We don't pay grad students enough. I can't fix that. All I can say is I appreciate what grad students do for us and hopefully it's a reciprocal relationship. Uh, beyond that, I mean, it, it takes a village to do research, right? And so here's the uh, FSU chemistry department essentially lined out, laid out in a collaborative map. And this is one of my favorite images on the FSU chemistry website. Each one of these is a faculty member in their respective domains. And each one of these connecting lines is a shared publication between them. And so it's a very highly collaborative department. We work together to solve problems. We cross boundaries as much as we can to, you know, uh, solve interesting problems. Beyond the chemistry department, collaborators outside of chemistry as well 
wells elsewhere in the world. Uh, can't do research without them. Uh, speaking of which, I mean, things like the facilities staff, the machine staff, uh, the fiscal office, I mean, it's so underappreciated. It, it literally takes a village. We can't do research unless the lights are on, unless the plumbing works, unless the glass blower is there to fix our broken glass. All of that matters. The fiscal staff purchasing things, processing our information, all these people matter. I put the dot, dot, dot because I can't list everyone. I apologize, but it's really important to have the support. Uh, shout out to FSU PR office, particularly Kathleen and Mark I met early and uh, lately Heather. Um, uh, and uh, yep, our, our team up there in the back that's actually recording this right now. Uh, FSU PR has been great in terms of delivering things. Uh, the other thing I'd like to thank is Florida State University. It's, it's a weird process getting an academic job. I mean, especially like you're going to give me a check for $750,000 to start a research group. This is amazing. But they're rolling the dice with that. That's a gamble, right? I could be a complete failure or I could be a success. They don't really know ahead of time. So thank you to FSU for taking a chance on me. Uh, ultimately, we got a bunch of additional funding. So hopefully we've paid back at least as much as we could. Uh, finally, last but not least, uh, I have to thank my family. And it's one of those things, I mean, outreach is great, education is great, research is great, but it comes at a cost, right? Both temporal and financial. And so the people that you need to support you, um, whether it be financially or time and, and, and balancing that, that cost benefit analysis, these are the individuals that do that, who's actually back in the room here. And so, yeah, thanks to Debbie, Bo, and Bryn, um, I couldn't do it without them. And so with that, I'll close and be happy to answer any questions. <laughs> Told you it was going to be fast. <laughs> yeah, and I think we have a couple of students here. I right? do. <laughs> they got their shout outs. <laughs> I first just want to say that I've I've known about your group for so long, but I've never fully understood it, and or I don't fully understand it. But I that was wonderful, wonderful. Um, that's that's guys. twenty years in about thirty minutes, so <laughs> that's a lot. Um, favorite, favorite guest. guest. That's a that's a cruel question, especially since this is going to be on the College of Arts and Sciences website. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm actually going to go outside of the College of Arts and Sciences. I'm going to go, one of my favorites so far is actually from the College of Music. Um, Julianne Grasso, she's a, she's a music theorist, and she actually wrote her PhD thesis on the, uh, the music of Final Fantasy IV, which is a video game. And so when you think about music, uh, video games actually surpassed movies and music in terms of entertainment costs per year in about 2005. And so it's actually the biggest inter entertainment industry in the world, and not a lot of people are studying the music involved with video games. And video games are actually harder to do music for because they're not linear. Right? You can go all sorts of different directions and the music changes accordingly. And she's one of the people that understands why do you do music the way you do? Why do certain tones make you feel a certain way? It's part of the experience and it's awesome because I, I, I play video games all the time, but I can't formalize that in any language where she can. So yeah, she's one of my favorites. If we, um, can we put out enough solar panels to power the countries or, or the one state? Or is, is, if we want to power all of Florida, one of the big, largest population states by population, if we cover the whole state with solar oh, panels. Yeah. No, you don't have to cover the whole state. So if you do a 20% efficient solar cell, I've, I've seen these maps before, you can find them online, but it's basically you need to cover about a quarter of Arizona and that would power the entire United States. And so that's, it's an enormous amount of power, and this is underappreciated. Like when you go out to your car after it's sat in the sun, the amount of heat that's generated, it's a lot of energy. And so even covering just the, the roofs of car houses, I mean, that's probably enough for most places. I mean, New York City where it's high density, it won't work, but. So when my local acquaintance who works for the power company here says, ah, they don't, can't store the power, I just need to talk. We can store it on a household level, right? Uh, you're not gonna, fly a 747 jet with batteries. So there, there is a cost benefit. Like there's certain scenarios where you want batteries, certain scenarios where you want fuels. But what I'll say is that solar cells right now are at cost parity with, the, with fossil fuels. Like if you get solar cells, the cost benefit is higher than the, the risk. It's worth it if you can put that money up front. My alma mater put solar panels over all of these storage lots where yep. people park their cars yep. when they live in a dorm or whatever. Yep. Why hasn't Florida State ever done that? Wow. 
why hasn't Florida done it? It's a sunshine state. Yeah, no, no, it's right. That's a double benefit, because right, when you think about your, so, your car outside, all of a sudden you turn on the air conditioning and just wasting fossil fuels to fight the sun, which is absolutely insane. No, I, I think it should be done. There are certain states that incentivize, you know, solar cells and things like that, and Florida's done a little bit of that, but it is the political climate in Florida that's inhibiting that. You don't have the sun like you think you should. Yeah, but even then, even when it's cloudy, there's still a lot of UV photons. I mean, it's still cost effective. It's, I, yeah, it's absolute insanity that we're not pushing that way. There used to be a solar magazine, Wind and Power or something, and they had advertisements in the front, and mm -hmm. it was like companies you never heard of. And then I picked it up like a couple of years later, you know, and it looked like Gulf Oil or different oil companies had bought up these companies. So is that Oh man, get what I'm getting at. the better person to answer that would be actually an economist. Like I know how solar cells work, I know how to make them, I know the process inside, but there's, there's economic and political forces that are beyond my control, and that's beyond my understanding as well. But I, as far as I know, the efficiency numbers there, the cost is worthwhile. Uh, anything beyond that is beyond my expertise. Thank you. As a now award winner, what would your biggest piece of advice be to an aspiring scientist? Oh man, I, most of my, like most of these transitions are just accidental events and you just like follow where the road takes you and see what comes up and things like that. I mean, it's, my answer would be make a lot of mistakes, but learn from those mistakes. And the more you do, the more things you try, the more mistakes you make, the more you learn in the process. And you hope that something actually works. Good. I, I should know the answer to this, mm -hmm. but I don't. What? What effect, if any, does increasing CO2 have on incoming light that fuels all the photosynthesis on the planet? So not much. Most of that, most of the photons that would hit us on the surface of the Earth are already absorbed by the atmosphere. And so CO2 is part of that problem. The, adding more CO2 is not going to affect solar cells that much. Yep. Well, at least that's one good thing. <laughs> that's, <laughs> glass is half full. I agree. Could we use a two-pronged thing and say free energy and it also reduces the input to the earth that's heating it up yeah no it, you, take, you get the free energy plus you're reducing the heat from the ground yeah I, I, but if you cover enough of the surface then you, you're you're solving that problem too no I, I agree and it's the same thing with like covering cars right where they want to get heated extra yeah no I'm, I'm all behind it I don't know how to sell it like there, there's, there's, you know, get political and economic forces that are just beyond me. The best I can do is go to Congress and say, hey, this would be cool if this happens. But yeah, it, it, it's a, it's a huge problem. We have to fight that battle. When did you pick photochemistry as like your area of study? It was always just like, hey, this is really cool. So it was actually. I, I changed major four times as an undergrad. I transitioned from athletic training to exercise science to biomedical science to chemistry. And the reason that happened is I was an athlete and I got hurt a lot, so I thought athletic training is what I wanted. And then each level of learning that I had, I was like, I want to dive deeper, I want to dive deeper. And I dove to the molecular level. And it was actually an organic chemistry, believe it or not, that I fell in love with chemistry. And so, so um, uh, Dan Gregory, the organic chemistry professor, forever changed my career by saying, hey, you're, you're interested in this. Maybe you should do an REU during the summer. And so I ended up doing summer research, which the National Science Foundation supports. The first time I got an airplane was to fly to Notre Dame to do research for the summer. And it was an amazing experience. But what I learned is I didn't want to do solid state synthetic chemistry, which is what I did that summer. But I learned about something else, which is the, the work of Mark Thompson at University of Southern California. And I learned about organic light emitting diodes, which is basically materials when you apply a voltage, it gives off light, which is common in like Samsung phones now. And he's part of that process. And so I fell in love with that idea and then there was no turning back for me. Uh, well, the part where, where you're dealing with um, the photons and mechanically change and they yep. change structure. What are, what applications are you looking at for that? Because I know I've heard molecular machines are for stuff like that. So. Yeah, that's exactly it. Like uh, the, the Department of Defense is really interested in those kinds of materials because you can imagine, you know, remotely controlling a robot. One that's interesting that I didn't know about is there's a, uh, when you take off in an airplane, there's a certain amount of resistance that goes over the wing, right? But depending on your speed, it actually changes the fuel efficiency depending on how rough the wing is 
which is interesting. Like why you have dimples on a golf ball because that makes it more aerodynamic, but you have to be a certain speed. And so one application they're interested in is shining light on it and actually making bumps or making bumps go away so you can maximize fuel efficiency, which I didn't know that existed, but I'm glad I learned about that. Um, but yeah, other things like robotics and controlling pumps and diffusion things where you can do it remotely with light. Uh, there's a lot of like cool origami folding things that you could do. Yeah, it's just, what do you do with this cool material, right? Question. Yep. Do you have solar at your house? I don't. We have a bunch of like 60 foot trees rounding our house and it's not cost effective. There's, there's websites, I think Google used to do this, where you can actually do an overhead satellite image and you say, if I put a solar panel here, is it cost effective? And our house is not, but the hurricane's helping, so <laughs> <laughs> we'll get there. Okay, I think that's it for questions. Thank you so very much, Ken. This was oh fascinating. Thank you. Thank you.